Hi, and welcome to Bio 201. This is your first video of your anatomy and physiology introduction unit. So I like to start off with some definitions. Anatomy is a study of structure of the body. This will primarily be in the lab. And physiology is the study of functions, and this will primarily be the lecture. So the way that your body works is through the combination of structure and function. So in order for your heart to pump blood around your body, there are different structures, different anatomy responsible for that, and then there's also the physiology going on. So the two of them work hand in hand. There are a few different methods to study anatomy. So a very common initial type is called cadaver dissection. So people donate their bodies and we're able to open them to look at the relationship between the structure and the function. Comparative anatomy is comparing different species to see evolutionarily what's going on. Physical examination is touching, listening, feeling to see what is happening. Gross anatomy is what's available to see with your eyes. And then histology is what you can see with a microscope. Here we have different levels of the hierarchy of the organism. So we start with a very tiny, tiny atom. Atoms come together to make molecules. Molecules come together to make macromolecules. Macromolecules come together to make cells. Cells work together to make tissues. And then we have organs, finally. Groups of organs work together to make systems. And then the systems work together to make the whole organism. If you guys haven't taken a bio class already and you may be a little rusty on some of these topics, definitely go through to review. Um, basic functions of the cell. These videos are meant to be kind of a quick review and me emphasizing different things. They're not meant to be a whole lesson for you. So a lot of this, because of the nature of the class, you guys are going to have to look into on your own. So if you're not familiar with what cells do, um, take a few minutes, find that in a textbook, and read about it. So tissues are groups of cells working together to do similar things. So there are four primary tissue types that we'll focus on. Muscle tissue is muscle. You guys are familiar. There are different types of muscles, so you guys are most familiar with skeletal. There's also heart muscle, cardiac muscle, and then there's smooth muscle that's found in your digestive system and in your arteries. Nervous tissue is sending electricity throughout the body. This allows you to have communication. Epithelial tissue is anything that is on the outside of your body. So your skin is epithelial tissue. And then epithelial tissue also lines all the cavities within your body. It also forms the glands. So like your sweat glands on your skin or different endocrine glands within the body. Connective tissue is basically everything else. So organs are two or more tissue types to form a specific function. So for example, in the stomach, we have epithelial tissue that's lining it. There's smooth muscle within it. Nervous tissue tells the muscles when to contract. And then connective tissue holds everything together. So most organs include all four types of tissue, um, but you only need two or more to be classified as an organ. Just a hint for you guys in the um, lectures, anything that's written in red, you don't need to know for the exam. It's kind of just there as an FYI. Body systems are groups of organs working together. So for example, the digestive system is mouth, stomach, intestines, and other organs not listed. 
On the left hand side in the box you see this list of body systems that we'll go through in Bio 201. And then in Bio 202 you guys will finish the rest of the systems. Bio 201 we don't quite go through as many because we need to spend a lot of time with introduction and review and then the nervous system is a huge section all on its own. Here are just other pictures, circulatory system, heart and blood vessels, digestive system, respiratory system for breathing, urinary system to get rid of waste, skeletal system for support, muscular system for movement, integumentary system, hair, skin and nails for protection, immune system for protection, nervous system for communication, Endocrine system, also kind of for communication, and then reproductive system for reproduction. These terms in the boxes down here are very, very important. Make sure you know all of these terms. These are your vocabulary words that you absolutely need to know before you even attempt to try and study the anatomy section in this class. The practice assignment number one will be really useful for you for these. Practice assignment. If you're not already familiar with these, I highly recommend this practice assignment. So the body can be cut into different planes. Sagittal plane separates the body into left and right halves. Frontal plane separates the body into front and back and transverse plane separates the body from top and bottom. Different anatomical terms here. Notice this is anatomical position. Her palms are facing forward. Anterior is going to be towards the front. Posterior towards the back. Superior is above towards the head. Inferior towards the feet. Medial is toward the middle. Lateral is away from the middle. Proximal and distal are referring to your limbs and how close they are to your core. So if something is proximal, it is very close to the core. If something is distal, it's further from the core. So for example, your fingertips are distal to your elbows. Your elbows are proximal to your wrist. Superficial is towards the skin and deep is away from the skin. Here we have some different um, cavities. So dorsal cavity is going to be brain and spinal cord. They get separated further into cranial cavity and spinal cavity. The ventral cavity is the front of the body. Thoracic cavity is heart and lungs. Abdominal cavity is the abdominal organs. And then pelvic cavity is mostly reproductive and urinary. Abdominal pelvic often gets combined. So we'll talk about this idea called homeostasis. This is what we call the maintenance of a dynamic steady state. So dynamic means that it's fluctuating. So we have a certain goal, a certain set point, but the body's not always exactly at that spot. It can go above or below that set point and that's still within a normal range. So an example we'll talk about in a minute is like body temperature. Body temperature is not always exactly the same. You might fluctuate plus or minus one degree on any given day and that's totally normal. And that's just the movement from the dynamic steady state. A um, little bit of history here if you guys are interested. Again, things in red you don't need to know for the exam. So in the body, we need to regulate all of these factors very tightly. Some of them a little bit more tightly than others. So we need to regulate the concentration of nutrient molecules. So oxygen, carbon dioxide, waste, water, salts, electrolytes, all of these get regulated. The pH, which is your acid-base balance needs to be regulated. 
body temperature, volume, and pressure. So all of these factors get regulated very tightly with different systems. Here we can see different systems and how they contribute to homeostasis. So for example, your respiratory system is maintaining the oxygen and carbon dioxide environment, and that also is linked with your pH, with your acid-base balance. There are a few different types of homeostatic control systems. We will go through each of these types on their own. So there's two different types here. There's intrinsic and extrinsic control. So intrinsic control is happening locally within an organ. So the change and the response both happen within that one specific location. Extrinsic control is happening outside. So this is more of a systemic response. So the change might be sensed and then acted upon from a different system. So the nervous system might impact your heart or whatever the situation is. We have two different types. There's feedback and feed forward. Feedback is a response after there's a change. Feed forward is a response in anticipation of a change. So feedback is kind of the more common one. If something happens, then we can respond to it. Versus feed forward, we're preparing for something to change. And then feedback is separated into two different ways. There's feed negative feedback, which is opposing the change. So we're trying to get back to homeostasis. And this is the most common because when changes happen in your body, the goal is to get them back to that neutral set point. There are three components. There's a receptor slash a sensor that's measuring the magnitude of change. There's an integrator control center, which is comparing what the sensor gave the information as to what the set point should be. So for example, the receptor might tell, might receive information that the body temperature is 99.6 degrees. The integrator will say, hey, the sensor told me it's 99.6, my set point says 98.6, we're a little bit too hot, so I'm gonna trigger the effector organs to do something. The effector organs are gonna be the ones doing the actual response. So in this case, it might be your sweat glands, and you start sweating. So in this example, you eat a lot of food, your blood sugar goes up. The receptors sense the increase in blood sugar, blood glucose, Pancreas secretes insulin, your body's able to absorb more glucose. Which is the receptor, which is the integrator, and which is the effector? Maybe pause this video for a second, think about it, and then I'll go through the answers in a second. So in this case, the receptor is going to be the receptors here. The integrator is your pancreas. It's comparing the set point to the receptors. And then the effectors are the insulin. Here is a different chart for people who like charts. Um, the example here in the middle in yellow is with a thermostat. And then the example in peach on the right is um, what's happening within your body. So for example, if you set your um, thermostat in your house, you set it to be whatever temperature, 75 degrees. The thermometer will sense the temperature and it will trigger the thermostat to increase in temperature. That will tell the furnace to kick on, increase the heat output, and will increase the room temperature back to the set point. This is kind of opposite of what we're thinking about right now in the summer. Um, but if you live in a cold place, this is what you're thinking of. Same thing happens in your body. If your body temperature goes below your set point, you have nerve cells that will acknowledge this, tell the temperature center to tell the muscles to start shivering, and then you increase your body temperature back to normal. 